Welcome to our uh, financial analysis, record keeping beyond and beyond session. Before we get started, you might want to print out a handout that's on the website called uh, Accounting Transaction Summary. We won't use this for just a little while, but it'll be important to have this at your possession as we start working through these transactions. The uh, essence of this webinar is to work on record keeping issues, primarily to look at entries into a cash based accounting system. This really becomes just the basis of your record keeping system and we'll talk on, in another webinar a little later about the financial implications that, that can be determined from reading a balance sheet or reading an income statement or looking at your cash flow. But for this particular session we're going to be only talking about record keeping issues and how we might do that in a more efficient uh, manner. One of the most important issues with record keeping is to be sure and keep a separate set of books for you and your household. I know that a lot of farm and ranch businesses are these family businesses that are really integrated together so it's sometimes hard to separate out some things that are Household expenses from those are the business, but it's important to do that. And mostly important because you want to make sure you know how the business is doing as it stands alone. Uh, and that becomes a really critical consideration from figuring out if you're profitable, whether you're accumulating equity, and so on in the business. The bookkeeping that we're going to do here is really more for management purposes. If you uh, need uh, tax accounting, uh, you need to. Uh, pay an accountant to provide that service to you because tax accounting is much different than what we're going to do primarily because you hire tax accountants to help you determine the implications of federal and state laws that happen to um, have some influence on the way that uh, different uh, items in your balance sheet or income statement are handled. So we're just going to be doing this for management purposes so you can use this to manage your farm or ranch operations. The other part is that lenders really demand accurate bookkeeping, and I think they've seen a, that change over the last several years, and that going in and talking to a banker without having a pretty good set of books is probably not possible. If you don't have those things in hand, they're going to be a little less interested in, for one, helping you put that together, and secondly, to uh, giving you any money if you haven't taken the time to uh, do some bookkeeping. So bookkeeping that we're going to be doing is really, uh, you know, compiling your business transaction. It's kind of like taking that whole shoebox full of receipts and invoices and other things that you have and uh, categorizing them. And we're going to talk about putting them into some buckets, if you will, that those buckets are called assets, liabilities, income, and expenses. What are we going to learn from this whole process? Well, at the end of the day, good set of books will allow you to, to have balance sheets and income statements and cash flow statements that are accurate. So we know a little bit about cash flow from the cash flow statement. We know a little bit about profitability from the income statement that we've created. And then we know whether our business is increasing in value or not by looking at the difference between our assets and liabilities, something we call owner's equity. So all those things are important as we think about this business and moving forward. So we're going to be doing bookkeeping, not very doing any tax accounting here. We'll leave that up to uh, to your tax accountant. There's a number of different methods for doing bookkeeping that are available to you. Manual books uh, are still used by many people. In fact, I was talking to a colleague in, down in Wyoming a few weeks ago, and one of the publications that Extension still produces there is their bookkeeping system, which is a manual set of books. It's just filling out some forms. Those forms, you know, come in the form of general journals, you know, general ledger, inventory records, accounts receivable, accounts payable, and so on. So that's kind of what's available in this in this uh, bookkeeping system. I think uh, people that want a simple system now are more likely to do it on a spreadsheet. I think spreadsheets are okay. The only thing that I will warn you about is, you know, if you have a mathematical formula errors that, in your, that are in your spreadsheet, obviously it's not going to work for you. I think sometimes you're better off putting money into a bookkeeping system. You can get into some you know, relatively sophisticated bookkeeping systems 
that really are not all that expensive. If you want to do something like QuickBooks, you know, you're going to be into a couple hundred dollars for a basic version of that Quicken, probably in the, you know, something less than a hundred dollars. There's other programs that are out there. Managing your money is one. There's a, you know, Finpack, which is a some bookkeeping software through the University of Minnesota that's, you know, is also a possibility, although it's very challenging to learn. But there's a number of different uh, ways to go. We're going to spend a little bit of time in this next year in some of our outreach in Montana looking at Quicken as being a place for people who have never used a digital system before to, uh, you know, adopt some bookkeeping that they can do on their computer at home. But again, going back to the same thing I said at the outset, make sure this is only, you know, really good business practice. Separate your business and your personal books from one another. Keep separate checks for your checkbooks. Okay, there's a number of different accounts that we have to worry about, and, and we're going to focus a lot of our attention on a couple of these and not very much attention on the others. But when we think about the books that you have, the first thing that you want to have in your bookkeeping system are those things that you own. Those are your assets. Those are the things that you these are the things that you have in the form of equipment and buildings and land base and so on that you have. So the things that you actually have in your possession. Liabilities, on the other hand, are those things that you owe money to somebody else for. So you have liabilities that might be in the form of debt that you carry. It would be the most common form of debt. You might have you know, accounts payable that you owe to somebody that did some work for you and so on. So you have... Those things that are in your possession, those being your assets, and then you finally come to this capital account, and I kind of misspoke just a minute ago in suggesting that assets are those things that you own. Well, you might have them in your possession, but capital really tells you what, how much you actually own because you're going to take the, these things that you have sitting around the farm or your equipment and your vehicles and you know your land base, et cetera, and you're going to subtract from that the money, money you owe on those, and then that will determine how much you own. That's the capital or equity that you have in the business. Probably the things we're most concerned about, really, from a day-to-day -day sort of standpoint, are you know how much money do you have coming in the business and how much is leaving. And we talk about that in terms of revenue, or if you like the word income, that's probably a more common term. Income is going to be the money that comes into the business in terms of the things that you've sold, you know, principally the grain or cattle you've sold will be important sources of revenue. And then you're going to have all these expenses that we have to then categorize. And these expenses are going to come in the form of, you know, fuel and oil and fertilizers that you've purchased and cattle feed and so on. All these things are going to be expenses against the business. So we're going to spend a lot of time on revenue and expenses and the things we do today and a little bit on the other things. But primarily we're going to be talking about a cash-based accounting system where we really want to have you have a good record of the money that's come into the business and the money that's flowed out of it over the course of the year. Equity uh, equals assets minus liabilities. I already talked about that. Your equity is the same thing as the capital in the business. And the uh, most it's just the most important identity, I suppose, in the, in the accounting world is that uh, you take your assets, subtract out the money that you owe on those things, and that determines how much you're worth or the equity that the how much the business is worth. The other important identity in uh, the accounting world is profits equal to your revenue minus your expenses. And you know, we've talked about that before as well. But typically the the profit's going to be your financial gain. And the, the thing I think about with profits, it's really an important consideration. I think people think about, well, I've made X number of dollars of profit. So let's say this business of ours has produced $50,000 worth of profits. Uh, you can't take the $50,000 and go down and spend it at Walmart. Well, why can't you do that? I mean, that seems reasonable enough. You've earned it. Why can't you go ahead and spend it that way? Well, the profitability that we talk about is really your profit without taking any account into loan payments that you might have and also income taxes that you might owe. So the profit that you earn has to then have those things subtracted first. The principal on your operating loan or on any loans that you have outstanding needs to be deducted from that. Uh, you've had a chance above the line to take care of the interest portion of that. But then in addition to that, you owe money to the Internal Revenue Service and also the State Department of Revenue here in Montana. And so those have to be subtracted out. So all of a sudden that $50,000 you have, maybe you will translate into something like, I don't know, maybe $20,000 or less that you actually have to spend on uh, other things that you might prefer to buy because the business has been profitable that year. So 
becomes a really important consideration. The most important thing about equity is it's kind of a long-term concept. This is like the wealth of the business. The uh, profitability is really a one-year sort of consideration. You want to know what's happened in this particular year of your business. And it gets a little convoluted, you know, and frankly, in the agricultural world because most agricultural enterprises are cash-based systems, um, which means that if you have some grain that you haven't sold by the end of the year, that doesn't show up as income, even though, you know, for all practical purposes, it is has increased the value of the business that you're in. And on the other hand, if you have feed that you purchased uh, that you hasn't been utilized either, that doesn't show, that'll show up in uh, the current year that you're in, but you won't have any income to uh, show, to offset that. So you get into this cash-based sort of accrual accounting sort of system that becomes a little awkward because you sometimes don't have the expenses that are tied to the production in a particular year. And so there's things that we can do to solve that. We're not going to cover those today, but there's things that you can do to make it look a little bit more realistic. So now we have some rules of the game. Everybody likes rules of the game. And uh, these are important conventions, and you'll see the importance of these as we kind of work our way through the examples that we're going to do. But uh, when we have an asset or an expense, those accounts, let's just use cash as an example of an, as an asset account, the money you have in the bank, as you add money into that, so you're going to add it in, it's going to be a positive value of money that's going in the bank, that asset value actually gets bigger. The same thing works for expenses. As you incur more expenses, when you add them into your accounting system, they're going to go in as positive numbers, and so you're going to have more expenses. So it's important to keep in mind that as with asset and expense accounts, both of them get bigger when you add things into them. Now this is really going to twist your mind around because on the other side of this, we have these transactions that are going to get bigger, but they're going to get larger with negative numbers added to them or included in them. So let's take revenue, for example. And this will maybe make a little bit of sense to you. So if we were going to increase our, so we've had some money that's come in to the, to the farm. We're going to treat that as revenue, say it's some grain that we've sold. So that's actually the amount of grain that we sold to the dollar amount that's going to go in our accounting system is a negative number. That's pretty crazy. But the, we're also going to have to have an offsetting account And that offsetting account is going to be cash, so our negative number is going to go into income. But then our asset account for cash is going to get bigger because we're going to put that money, the money is going to show up as cash. So we get into some really challenging sort of arithmetic here in a way as you think about assets and expenses getting bigger with positive numbers, liabilities, capital, and revenue getting bigger when you have negative numbers. And hopefully by the time we get all the way through all these transactions we're going to do, that will seem perfectly clear to you. So we won't dwell on it anymore right now. So we're going to have some terminology we need to um, to be particularly uh, cognizant as we kind of work through this. One of them is current assets. And this becomes really important for businesses because these are the resources you have that can be turned into cash really almost immediately. I put within one year up here, but really you want to have those things you can get. You can turn them into cash almost immediately right now. And of course, you know, a cash account or checking account is a good example of that or a savings account. In some cases, you might argue that some grain you have in the bin or hay you have stacked out there or the cattle you own might be examples too. I would be inclined to say, well, you know, those aren't quite as liquid as uh, checking and savings accounts, but they're pretty liquid. You could go take all your grain to the elevator if you needed and you could probably turn it into cash, uh, you know, pretty quickly. Intermediate assets are things that you can't turn into cash readily. And this gets into the, you know, especially the depreciable, you know, cattle and bulls you, or cows and bulls you might have in a place or your machinery and equipment or vehicles. Things like that are intermediate assets that if things were bad enough, you could probably go out and sell them, but it might take you some time to get rid of them. So just think about it kind of in those terms. Long-term assets in terms of farms and ranches is really your land base. 
you know, you know, I know that most of you would prefer that you never have to worry about having to sell this land base to somebody or to put it on the market. But this is the uh, these are things that are going to be turned into cash over long periods of time. And if you've ever been around somebody trying to sell agricultural land, um, you'll understand that what I'm saying here because that may take you several years before you find the right buyer that comes by that's going to be interested in buying this property from you. So you have these, all these assets are kind of stacked up out there in terms of how liquid they are moving from those that are the most liquid to call current assets to those that are going to take the longest term to get rid of those being long-term assets. You have exactly the same concept over on the liability side. So keep in mind the assets are those things that you have in your possession, but now we're going to figure out how to pay for them. And there are things out there that you got to pay for right away. And I, again, I have one year up there, but I still like to think about these current liabilities as things that you can probably go pay them tomorrow if somebody calls you up on the phone and told you to get in there and pay it. So things that I like to think about that are in that category are really accounts payable, money you owe to other people, like maybe you owe something to the you know, per person that supplies gas and diesel fuel to you. You could get a call from the Internal Revenue Service, the Department of Revenue here in Montana, that says, hey, we need some money from you. That also is a current liability because you got to pay that as soon as you can. And usually within one year for tax, you know, in normal sort of tax stories, that works. And then you might have some other things. Uh, interest might be one of those that somebody wants to come in and pay the interest on a loan you have or, or whatever. So... Things that you need to pay off right away are current liabilities. And again, they kind of follow the same pattern. Long-term, intermediate and long-term liabilities typically are those things like equipment being more intermediate. And then mortgages that you might have on buildings and land turn out to really be what we're talking about when we talk about long-term liabilities. Those things that might go on for 30 years or more where equipment loan probably going to be something less than seven years uh, in most cases. So you get, you get all these things where you owe people money. And again, there's a term attached to that. On the revenue side, you know, most of you are familiar with this, I think, because you watch the selling of your livestock and crops and you might get some agricultural program payments that come in from the you know, agricultural risk coverage or from the price loss coverage programs. I might get some crop insurance proceeds. All these things are income to you. It's just money that's flowing into your operation. And you're, you have, after we subtract out some expenses in this, these are all things you're going to owe some money to the IRS or to the State Department of Revenue for. So you have income. It really comes in the form for most of you in terms of sales, and these being the most important pieces of those sales. But on the flip side of that, you've got the cost of producing all of that revenue, and these things are what we call the expenses in terms of the amount you spend on feed, fertilizer, seed, and so on. If you got any labor that's hired, interest that you've paid on any loans, and then we have this concept of depreciation. At the bottom here, which is sort of kind of an elusive thing to think about, we'll talk about a little bit a little later, but it's essentially taking a piece of equipment that you bought and being able to um, expense part of that every year for several years rather than taking the expense in the first year that you might have owned it. So it's not like a crazy concept in a way because you say, well, you know, why can't I take the depreciation and expense it early? Well, it could be that you're a young farmer. He's bought a bunch of equipment. He can't use the depreciation the first several years he's in business anyhow because he's not making any money. And would really prefer to be able to use it later. So that's some of the logic involved in spreading it out. Depreciation is just a process of spreading out uh, these expenses over a long period of time. The last part of this is this business about how wealthy are you, or at least how much wealth is tied up in this business that you have. And this is just taking the assets that you have identified and subtracting out the money you owe against those things. And that becomes what the business contribution is every year to your wealth. You might have also in, you know, put some more money into the business. You maybe took some savings out of your bank account and put it over into the business at some point in time. That becomes important. You might belong to a cooperative who gives you some money that's uh, you know, in the form of patronage, it's essentially savings to you that you might just decide to plug into your business in some way. So other things can make your equity a bigger in this, but principally it's the money you're making in the business in addition to that that you've invested in it when you started. So 
really important concept, though, because this tells you how wealthy you are as a business. It might not be what you can get out of the business if you were to put it on the market. Book values versus the market value of some of these farms are very different from one another. But it gives you a sense about whether the business is either increasing in wealth or decreasing. We'll go through this pretty quickly here. But this is the chart of accounts we're going to do today. And if we were setting you up with a bookkeeping system like Quicken, we'd go through and set up each one of these accounts uh, so that you can enter your transactions into this. We're not going to spend very much time reviewing these other than a few really important ones and you'll get a chance to tackle the other ones as we move through this, uh, this series of uh, transactions. When we think about assets, probably the most important one we're going to deal with today is checking accounts. We're going to have this checking account that's going to get bigger when we put more money into it and it's going to get smaller when we take money out of it. We'll deal with a few liabilities here too. We'll talk a little bit about kind of the credit cards and accounts payable. You know, those kind of are like cash in a way because that's how we're going to pay for some things, but we're going to pay for our expenses out of those. So this is where your mind's going to get twisted around when we get to those because you're going to find that when we make this credit card balance get bigger, we're going to be doing it with by plugging in a negative number into that because we have another transaction on there, another uh, entry on the other side of that, the expense account that has to gets bigger when we type a positive number into that cell. So we'll have a chance to talk about that here soon. And then we have capital. We'll talk just a little bit about money moving in and out of capital. In fact, we'll do that right off the bat in one example. When we get over to the the accounts that matter for our income statement. We have sales accounts that will be really important to us as we think about money coming into the business. And again, this is going to twist your brain around a little because it's going to come in as a negative number because we're going to have to offset it with cash or your checking account in most cases, which will be entered as a positive number. But So income is going to be an important is really critically important to us because it's the revenue that we're earning. And then we have all these expenses, starting with depreciation, moving all the way through to fuel and interest and payroll taxes and a whole bunch of other things as we move through our chart of accounts. So let's get with it here. We're going to go ahead and uh, open our farming operation up. We're going to we've just... Uh, we're going to uh, put some money uh, into our checking account, essentially. So we're going to go to our bank account, and we're going to that's uh, our personal banking account at the local bank, and we're going to take twenty grand out of there, twenty thousand dollars, and we're going to put that in a business checking account. So when we think these through, let's always think through the cash part of it first. And the cash, in, in the terminology we're using here, is going to be the same as checking. So checking and cash account are going to be synonymous with one another. So let's think about what happens. Remember, this checking account is an asset account, so it's going to get bigger when we put a positive number into that. Well, wow. what does that all mean in terms of what we have here on the screen? Because we have this thing called debit and credit. Well, a debit is when it goes in as a positive number. A credit is when it goes in as a negative number. So you're going to have to choose here. which one of these it's going to fit into. So let's think about this. Think about the checking account first. Okay, So we have $20,000 that we've taken out of personal savings, and now we're going to put it into the business. So we need to figure out where's the money going to go, and then how do we enter it into this bookkeeping system so it is, um, accurately reflects what we've done. Well, first off, we know checking is going to be a, is going to get bigger. Remember, we're putting $20,000 worth of money on the business by debiting it. So the first one we're going to have is we're going to first off debit the checking account. And then we have to have an offsetting account. This is something if you were taking an accounting because you're talking about it, the, the T account. And the, so we have to have another something to balance that out that will be a credit in this particular instance. Because remember, our books have to always balance. And our credit's going to be for equity. Well, what is equity? Well, that's just the value of the business. 
And so what we're essentially doing is taking $20,000, putting it in the checking account, and we're saying, well, this is just the money that this is what this business is worth right now. It's worth 20000 bucks because we put that, that, that amount of money in there. And if we want to take it out some point in time, we're going to take it out of that equity account also. So when we get done with this transaction, it looks a little bit like this. Now, the question you need to ask yourself, and this kind of keeps you straightened out with the uh, important part of the bookkeeping that goes on, is uh, how much money is in my checking account now? So let's go ahead and make these entries in this accounting summary. So move over to, uh, once the beginning balances are all zeros, and then go to column one. And you'll notice there that we should have made an entry into account number 1000 $20,000. And then we should have gone down to our equity account, which is account number 3000 which is down the page of ways. And we're going to offset that with a negative number. This is going to be our credit to the equity account. And if you look all the way at the bottom, uh, you can then think about, well, how much money should be in my checking account? Well, that's pretty easy at this point because the only transaction we've done is just adding 20000 bucks into the checking account. So the checking account should have a balance of 20000 So you should have three numbers in that column. One in account number 1000 you should have $20,000. One in account number 3000 for 20, negative 20000 And then enter $20,000 at the bottom in the checking account row, which we'll use for all of these transactions. And that should be $20,000, essentially the same number you have above in account number 1,000. OK, now the work begins. we got money to spend. So how are we going to go out and spend this? Well, one of the things we're going to do, we're going to go out and buy this piece of older equipment, which is treated as that, uh, using money in our checking account. So it's going to cost us 5000 bucks to buy this piece of equipment. And we're essentially going to treat this piece of equipment as something we're just going to we're just going to bill it out over the year. We're not it's just some used piece of equipment and something we're probably not going to worry about spreading the cost out over time. So what are those transactions going to be? Well, think about the checking account first. If you take care of that one first, the rest of it's pretty easy. So we have checking account, remember that's an asset and equipment here which is also an asset. Wow, we have a count that where we have two assets that we have to worry about. So let's think about this. So we're going to take $5,000 out of the checking account. So we need to credit our checking account. And we have now a piece of equipment that we're going to be using that's worth $5,000. So we've just essentially converted $5,000 worth of cash into this piece of used equipment. So what about this transaction? How much money do we have left in our checking account? Well, we had $20,000 in there before. Remember, we've now credited our checking account, so we've subtracted $5,000 from that. So we should have something about $15,000 in our checking account. OK, we might want to purchase a piece of equipment also with um, using a uh, Credit, or we're using some credit from the from our local bank. And again, we're just assuming we're going to buy some used equipment here. And uh, we're going to pay uh, $10,000 for that. Now, how are we going to pay for this? Well, you notice that our checking account doesn't show up here. That's because we're not paying, we're not paying cash in this particular instance. We're actually going to be doing something somewhat different. We're going to be taking out a loan to do this. We'll talk about loan transactions a little bit later, but we're going to take out a loan to buy this piece of equipment. Now remember this notes payable is going to be a liability. So it's going to get bigger with the negative number or with the credit and our equipment's just going to be an expense item as far as we're concerned here. So what's going to happen? Well, kind of think about our notes payable a little bit like we might think of cash because we're going to have to use the notes payable then to to uh, pay for this piece of equipment. And at some point in time, we'll go back and pay this off to the bank. But initially, we're going to be using that to make this transaction. So what we have is this notes payable to the bank of $10,000. We're going to go grab that money from the bank. 
And uh, we're going to take it over and give it to the equipment dealer to buy this used piece of equipment for 10000 bucks. So we're going to credit what's payable and then in turn expense this out as uh, this equipment out at $10,000. So the next question you have to ask yourself is, uh, well, what's the implications of this on my checking account? Well, you're fortunate because there's no implications because no money flowed in or out of your checking account. So for column number three, you should have an entry that looks something like under 1600 machinery and equipment, you should have like $10,000. It's a positive number because it's an asset. And then down below, down here, we're going to talk about something like notes payable, which is a $10,000 uh, line number 2300, a negative $10,000, which is the money that we now owe to the bank for this piece of equipment that we just purchased. The third thing we might want to do is hire some labor. And uh, we're not going to get too far into the labor details here, but you can hire contract labor on a farm if you want. Uh, you just uh, you don't have to worry about running them through your payroll system, which is somewhat of a challenge. So uh, in this particular case, you're going to pay this person coming to work for you $1,000. And you're just going to sit down and write a check to them. So it's a pretty simple transaction when you think about this uh, labor that's uh, coming to work. And uh, so let's think about uh, what's going to happen. We'll think about the checking account side of it first. We know our checking account is going to get smaller. So something in the form of a credit is going to be necessary. And then contract labor is just going to be an expense that we pay for the farm. So we end up with something that looks like this. We get checking is going to be a thousand. A checking account is going to be reduced by a thousand bucks, and we're going to have this thousand dollars we're going to pay to this person to work for us. So, for your transactions you have, we're going to have something that looks like negative thousand under your checking account, and then um, under something called labor, all the way down to six thousand fifty, we're going to pay the thousand dollars to them, and then we should have. Uh, about $14,000 left in our checking account. Okay, so we're already over to column five. We're marching right along here. So what about something a little bit more traditional maybe than all the transactions we've looked at so far? And uh, what happens if we buy some fuel? And we're going to do this a little bit differently because we're going to we're not going to take out a notes payable with the bank, but we're going to um, we're going to just Put this on a credit card that we have. Okay, so we have a thousand dollars worth of fuel, and remember, our credit card is going to be a liability here. That we're going to owe that money to somebody downstream here, and fuel is just going to be an expense. So remember that credit card is going to get bigger with the credit, and, and our fuel is going to get bigger with the debit. So let's see what happened here. Well, so we're going to sign this to our credit card. So we're going to have $1,000 we're going to put on this credit card of ours. And uh, with that $1,000, we're going to pay for $1,000 worth of fuel. So if you're, you're tracking these down, you're going to have either, uh, account number 2010 is going to have a negative 1,000. And uh, your fuel account, 6,010, is going to be increased by $1,000. So what happened to our checking account in this particular instance? Well, we've already been through the same kind of story before when we talked about notes payable. This is really no different. And so we are not going to infringe on our checking account. We're going to go ahead and borrow the money from a credit card company. So our amount of money we have in our checking account remains unchanged. We still have $14,000 there to spend. Okay, we have uh, taken a piece of our equipment into town and uh, having our local mechanic work on it. So he's going to work on this tractor of ours, and uh, he's going to charge us uh, 500 bucks to do that. Well, in many smaller communities, in particular, maybe not so much in more urban areas these days, but in smaller communities, they're willing to give you a little bit of credit to do that. We call that kind of credit accounts payable. 
And then you're going to get a chance to pay them back, you know, maybe 30 days later or sometime, you know, later in the year. But we're going to start off with, um, you know, doing the repairs for you and, and um, willing to put it on their books, doing accounts payable for you. So remember, as with the credit cards we talked about in the notes payable before, accounts payable is going to get bigger when we credit it, and repair expense is going to get bigger when we debit it. So we end up with something that looks like this again. Where we have our accounts payable is 500 bucks, and we need to pay that back at some point in time down the road. And our repair expenses here are $500. Uh, and we're, so we, we have that entered into our, our books as an expense item. It doesn't need to be an adjusted expense, it's an expense. So, um, based on the discussion we've just had, uh, how much money is in our checking account? Well, same story as before. We don't, uh, we didn't take any money out of our checking account. We just allowed Dave's Repair Shop to go ahead and hold that for us for a little while, and then we'll go ahead and pay them later. Well, lo and behold, you know, time hasn't passed more than a few days here, and we get this bill from Dave's Repair, and he uh, wants his money. So I remember before we had essentially credited accounts payable and then we had gone down into our repair line 6060 and we had debited that now he, he wants his money so there's so our checking account comes into play in this particular case because we're essentially going to be just paying this bill so what happens is again let's think about the checking account part of it first remember checking accounts get bigger when we debit them so that might give us a hint about what our offsetting transaction needs to be. So we have $500 of credit. So we're going to credit our checking accounts getting smaller. And we're going to pay off the bill by debiting accounts payable. And you notice from what we did before that uh, that accounts payable was a credit before. Lo and behold, this time is a debit, so that's going to, that account's just going to go away. That $500 is out of there, and now we've paid for it with this $500. So uh, what's been the impact on our checking account now? We're finally back to dealing with cash actually flowing out of the business in some you know, sort of very explicit way. And our checking account now is only has $13,500 in it because we finally paid this bill to this uh, person that's done this work for us. Okay, it's approaching the uh, August, September sort of time frame here and uh, money's coming in. That's always a good thing. You know, you've sat through the whole year, if you're a farmer in particular, you know, you planted this expensive crop of yours in the springtime and now you're waiting till the late summer, early fall to harvest it and uh, it looks pretty good because you've got some money that's going to roll in here because you have some wheat to sell. Yeah, not all farmers operate that way. I mean, they store some wheat and they sell it throughout the year. But if you're in a situation where you don't have the ability to do that, you may be harvesting your crop and hauling into the elevator. That's kind of what we're thinking about here. So that's, again, let's go back and think about what we're looking at here. So remember, we have checking, which is an asset account. We talked about that numerous times and then we have this little wheat sale item here that's really twists our mind around when we think about this but this will help us help you understand this now because let's think about checking first what's going to happen to this checking account when we get this money in on this wheat that we've sold well it's going to get bigger and how does it get bigger it gets bigger because we debit it so that gives you a hint about what your offsetting transaction needs to be. And so we get something that looks like this. So what on earth are these entries that you have to make? Well, you know one of them is checking. You're going to put $10,000 in the checking account, but then you're going to go down to the sales account down here called um, 4100, and you're going to put a negative number in there so that it offsets the, uh, the amount of money in the checking account. Because remember, I said before, Whatever entries you put in there have to sum up to zero. We have a double entry bookkeeping system. So what's happened now to our checking account? 
well, things are looking pretty rosy because all of a sudden we have more money in there. In fact, we have $10,000 more money and having a checking account balance is um, $23,500. That's pretty good news. Okay, we also might have some unsold wheat inventory at the end of the year and we want to put an adjustment in there so that our books look a little bit more realistic because maybe we had produced that wheat in the year but we just didn't have a chance to get out and market it yet or it might have been put in storage whatever the case might be but anyhow we have this unsold wheat that's there and we're going to make an entry into our bookkeeping system now to essentially credit the farm for this additional inventory. And this is a pretty legitimate thing to do because you've produced it, but you just haven't sold it yet. So what about this unsold wheat? Well, we actually have an account in our bookkeeping system to help us out a little bit. So if you look at account number 1990, you'll see we have an asset account out there called unsold wheat. And that's what, you know, wheat, just like, you know, owning another asset like a piece of equipment, is something that has a lot of value. And so we want to make sure that shows up as an asset even though we, we, you know, we're essentially just storing it at this point in time, and we'll sell it at some point in time in the future. But then what's that offset against? Well, this is where we get into a non-cash transaction. It's a little harder maybe to understand, but this unsold wheat just represents additional value in the business, additional equity, if you like, if you like the word wealth. That's another way to phrase this. So what do we end up with here? Well, we end up with something where we have this, unsold wheat, as I remember it's an asset that's going to get bigger when we debit it. So we have five thousand more value dollars of value and then we show that as additional equity in the business. Remember when we started this set of transactions here, we put twenty thousand dollars out of our personal checking account into this business to get it off the ground and uh, now we've added five thousand dollars to that of production. But the production is unique in one way because it hasn't been sold yet. But we still want to count that into our bookkeeping system. So now you might want to think about the age-old question, what happened to our checking account? Think about that in just a minute. I don't see checking account up on either one of our categories we've listed here. So our checking account has just stayed the same. Even though we have this, uh, the business has actually become a little more valuable. If you have the other side of that, though, maybe you've purchased some animal feed during the year that's just unused. You know, maybe you bought a little bit more hay than you needed, so it's just sitting out in the corral out there waiting to be fed at some point in time. But uh, you're going to make this, again, an end-of-the-year transaction to have your books better reflect what's gone on in this business during the year. Okay. So let's see what happens here. So we have this unused animal feed at the end of the year. And uh, you'll notice again, if you look in column, you know, go down column 10 now and look over to account number 1995, lo and behold, there's something called unused supplies. That's a good place to put our unused feed. And uh, again, this is, has some value because it's just this hay that's sitting there is not going to depreciate. I don't think it's not going to be something that's going to become worthless. So we want to be sure and account for that in our books, and it's going to essentially add some value to our business. So we're going to go through you know, pretty much the same transaction again. The unused fee is going to be debited for $1,000, and the business is going to become $1,000 more valuable. So you have account 3000 that's going to be have a negative one thousand dollars in account nineteen ninety five it's gonna be a positive one thousand. You might want to think again, what's the impact on our checking account? Well, lo and behold, as with the last the last entry that we did, there's no impact. Because all you're doing is putting some bookkeeping adjustments to make your books more accurately reflect what's happened during your production year. The last thing you might want to do at the end of the year is to um, do something called take depreciation. Now, I'll warn you about depreciation. Um, when I was in business, I always left this decision up to my accountant. Rarely did I make depreciation decisions because depreciation is one way to do some income tax planning. 
In fact, for many businesses, when they talk about income tax planning, all they're talking about is doing allocations of depreciation and perhaps maybe looking at some unsold wheat they might have out there, some unused supplies, some of those sorts of things, or maybe purchasing supplies this year that you might use next year. There's all kinds of things that you might do to do some income tax planning, but depreciation is probably the most important in many, in many times. So what happens in depreciation? Well, let's think about this just a minute. In fact, we'll look at depreciation in just a little bit different way, just because we have some numbers we have to track along with here. We might think about it in this way, where maybe we're going to do something with equity, but that's really not what we want to do with depreciation, though, because even though we own the piece of equipment, we can we want to clarify this a little bit by identifying uh, equipment expense or an equipment asset account. So let's think about what goes on here. Well. What's happening to this piece of equipment? You know, we've owned it for a while, and now we want to take some depreciation on this thing. So that means that we're going to spread out the cost of this piece of equipment over some years. In this particular year, we have $2,000 of that that we might do something with. In fact, if we took that $10,000 piece of equipment we bought before, and we figured it was about five years worth of depreciation there, we'd get $2,000 a year that we then could take as an expense. That's kind of how people think about it. So what's happened? Well, that $10,000 equipment has essentially become worth $2,000 less. And that kind of makes sense. You know, you bought it and you use it for the year and if you were to try to sell it to somebody, it probably is worth $2,000 less. So you get $2,000 that you're able to take off the value of the equipment. So if you go up to line 1600 machinery and equipment all of a sudden you have some equipment that's worth less so that's going to be your credit of two thousand dollars and down at the very bottom down here is this thing called depreciation and this allows us to treat it as an expense so we can actually pay lower fewer income taxes because we have this expense that we can essentially write off that's kind of the terminology that's used and so we have $2,000 It's there, so expenses have essentially increased by 2000 bucks. So what's been the impact on our checking account? Well, I fed you a lot of examples here where the checking account just doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter here either because no cash is changing hands. You're just doing a bookkeeping transaction that's moving some money around from this equipment account to you know, an expense account and allowing you to take... Uh, advantage of the tax rules and write off some of this equipment you bought. So again, we have a situation where our bank account hasn't changed at all. Okay, that day does come around when uh, you've got to go visit the bank. and uh, These are always uh, relatively challenging times, as I remember, of having to go in and uh, pay off your bank loan, or at least make some progress towards paying it off. There's a couple concepts here that are really important, though. Principle is just like renting a car. When you go out and rent a car from Enterprise down here, or from Hertz or somebody, you know, they want the car back. They're not giving it to you for you to run away with it. So that's the liability part of this, and that's essentially what you're doing when you pay, going to the bank. You're going to first off when you pay off a loan, you're going to pay them for the car. Keep in mind, you're just renting the car now. You're not buying it. You're just going to pay them for, the, for that. But in addition to that, you're going to pay them for some use of that particular automobile. In this case, it's something that like we might call interest. So you have this thing that you bought that costs some money, but then the money you're paying to essentially pay the bank back for helping you buy this uh, this asset of yours is uh, interest. All of you are familiar with that. You go buy a car, you know, charge you some, some amount of money, maybe right now 2 or 3% to borrow the money, and then and if you're, when you pay it back, you're paying back the interest plus the principal. So how does this go in the bookkeeping system? 
So we're going to, first off, we're going to pay the bank $10,000 of principal and then 1000 bucks worth of interest. So this would be kind of like if you went out and borrowed an operating loan for you borrowed you know, $10,000 at the beginning of the year. And then at the end of the year, you're going to pay them back, but you're going to pay them back the principal of $10,000, but you're also going to pay them $1,000 worth of interest. So let's think about how this works out in our bookkeeping system. Okay, to help you think this through, the best thing to do, go down to that checking account again. What's going to happen in that checking account? Well, you know, if you've had to make these payments, you know what's going to happen. You're going to have to write a check to the bank for 11000 bucks. Well, that's a lot of money. But then how is this going to be distributed between the... Uh, the loan, you know, the amount of money you borrow from them, and then how, what portion of it is the interest portion, which you can actually deduct from your ta the taxes payable. I mean, this just helps because you're going to have a deduction, essentially, from the income you've earned. You can deduct the interest against that, and you're going to pay fewer taxes. So what's this going to look like? Well, this probably as many of you had guessed. You're going to, have, you're going to write this $11,000 check to the bank. So your checking account's going to change by eleven thousand dollars, and your uh, the offsetting transaction series are going to give the money back to the bank, the ten thousand bucks, but then they're going to charge you thousand dollars for the privilege of borrowing it from them. So what's happened to your checking account? Well, something pretty fundamental is happening this time around because you've lost eleven thousand dollars. So your checking account balance now is only twelve thousand five hundred. So where did those entries go, though? Well, you have this notes payable of uh, $10,000. It's a positive number. And if you go down to interest, which is account number 7,010, you have $1,000 worth of interest. Those add up to $11,000. Your checking account at the very top should go down by $11,000. Okay? Okay, something you might like to do occasionally is actually pay some money to yourself. That becomes a relatively noble thing to do. So you're going to uh, think about taking out a withdrawal of uh, a couple thousand dollars. And you might think about how this withdrawal is going to be, how is this withdrawal going to be used? Okay. Well, again, go to the checking account. And remember that something kind of unusual is going on here in a way because where you're accumulating wealth or earnings in the business is in that account called equity. This is where you're accumulating some money that you can eventually pay to yourself. So what we're essentially going to do, we're going to go and write a check to ourselves and we're going to draw it out of that account that we've been saving in the business all this time. So what's this likely to look like? Well, we know we're going to write a check, right? But we're just going to write the check to ourselves. But remember, we're not writing it to ourselves as the business. We're writing it to ourselves as the household, we're taking money out of the business and giving it to the household. So we end up with something that looks like this. So you're going to have $2,000 worth of uh, credit that happens to come out of this bank account. So we can have a negative 2,000 up there, and then down below on that good old 3,000 account number, you're going to have a positive $2,000. Remember that that account gets bigger as you credit it and smaller as you debit it. So that's exactly the right logic. It should get smaller. We're going to have less money in the business now because we've taken some money out to put in our own, our own checking account. So what's happened to our account now? Remember, we had $12,500 in it before. And here we are. We've just done this transaction for 2000 bucks. So lo and behold, we're down to $10,500 in our checking account. Okay, one of the issues we talked about at the, you know, at the outset of this was this business about whether you're hiring somebody or having them work for you as an independent contractor. You can do that in any business. You can hire people that work for you as independent contractors, but you've got to be very careful in what you're doing because if 
they think they're an independent contractor, but you're actually treating them as an employee by giving them instructions. In particular, if they get injured on the job, they may come back and sue you. Even if they're doing something simple of building some fence for you, if somebody gets injured and they can prove that they were really an employee of yours rather than being an independent contractor, um, you could be in deep trouble. So when you think about independent contractors, that's the story we did uh, you know, a while back and paying this particular independent contractor coming to work for you about a thousand bucks. Remember, if you're going to be an independent contractor, you can't give them any instructions other than to tell them you want some fence built. You can't do any training for them. Uh, the work that they're doing can be essentially essential to the to this company that's doing the work for you. I mean, it can't be they're doing this work for you and, and not for their own, just for their own benefit in the sense that they're earning money from it. But uh, it becomes critical in that way. Uh, they have to work their own hours, and there's a whole bunch of other rules. I think there's a 20 rules, if I'm not mistaken, that. Uh, play into this decision. There's some reasons this really works. It saves you some money. That's the reason a lot of farmers will try this. Um, they'll hire people, pay them cash under the table. Not a good idea, let me tell you. Um, but you save all this money. You don't have to pay any Social Security or Medicare on them. Um, you don't have to pay on any, any unemployment tax. You don't have to pay any workman's compensation. You don't have any of those responsibilities. They don't have any commitment to you, really. They're, you might think that there's less liability. I'll talk to you about that in just a second. But and you don't have to worry about, if you were me here in Bozeman, worrying about union activity with them. So they essentially, an independent contractor takes care of all of their own expenses. On the other hand, though, uh, if you get caught doing that, and uh, you're going to get you're going to pay big time in a couple different ways. One of them is that you could get fined by the federal government because you're trying to avoid paying payroll taxes. But secondly, you might get sued by them if they happen to get injured on the job. That's the reason you got to be really careful. So paying people cash and treating them as independent contractors can, has a very dark side to it. If you get if things don't go well, if everything works out hunky dory, you're not going to worry one way or the other. But if things don't go very well, you can end up with having some trouble with the. Uh, payroll laws in the United States, but also having these people come after you uh, with a liability suit, which could be much more dangerous to you. And there's other, you know, other risks, you know, no control, limited right to fire and so on, but the first two are the really only ones that matter. So let's think about this. We're going to go ahead and actually hire somebody as an employee and see how this works out for us. So we're going to, uh, we're going to pay the employee, and then we have all these taxes we have to worry about uh, that we also have to take into account. And the taxes come in a couple of different forms. One of them is, you know, we need to pay the state of Montana, but secondly, we need to pay the federal government. And then we might have some other things that we pay the employee to. We're not going to worry about these, but maybe you cover their health insurance or you give them a little bit of pension. Uh, those are all it's the option of the business. And, you know, I don't know too many farms and ranches that do that, but some, some certainly do. So what about these payroll calculations? They're pretty interesting. You end up with um, this person working for you. I mean, you've probably told them that they, maybe they can work for you for uh, you know a couple thousand dollars a year or for uh, for a month. And over that month, um, you uh, have agreed to pay them. So you sit down to write their payroll check. Well, what happens when you do that? Well, first off, you start off with the twelve, the uh, two thousand dollars, and uh, Then you have to worry about the deductions. And the deductions out of their paycheck are really important. One of them takes care of Medicare and Social Security. You have to uh, subtract out those costs. So that turns out to be about $153 in my example here. You also have to withhold federal income taxes on them. So that's another $197. Bucks. So you're kind of paying forward with your income taxes. And then Montana taxes are going to cost you about $75, $76 in this particular case. So you have $426 worth of money that you owe them and you're going to have to take out of their check and then you'll see in a minute you're going to have to pay it to the state and federal government. So you end up with the take-home pay being $1,574. A good way to estimate how much money you're going to get a take-home pay in your check if you're working for somebody is about three-quarters of whatever the uh, total amount of the check happens to be.
Now the business has some obligations attached to this as well. And the business obligations are uh, have their own set of challenges associated with them. First thing you have to do, you have to match the FICA or the Medicare and Social Security, and your match is the same exact thing that the employer has to, the employee has to pay. So you have to come up with $153 for that. State unemployment is going to cost you $36. Federal unemployment is going to cost you $16. Bucks. Then you got to pay workman's compensation, and that'll all depend on you know how safe your place of work has been for people that are working for you. So you have to. Uh, all these things become really important considerations in payroll. So you have $405 on top of, remember, you've already agreed to pay this guy $2,000. But in addition to what you pay him, you've got $405 on top of that that you have to come up with as an employer. So really, the total cost of him going to work for you isn't $2,000, but it's actually $2,405. So the total cost looks something like this. You got this gross salary plus these payroll expenses that need to be paid to this guy. So you have a couple steps that you have to go through to manage this. One of them is that you're first going to write a check to the person that you've hired. And uh, that check that you're going to write to him is going to be... Um, for fifteen hundred and seventy four dollars. Two thousand dollars of that's going to be the labor expense to you and the other four hundred and twenty six is going to be the uh, taxes payable. So you might think about how that's going to be entered in. So remember we have this check that we're going to write to him for fifteen seventy four. So our checking account gets smaller by fifteen hundred and seventy four dollars. You move down to line number 2150, you notice that there's payroll taxes payable. We'll see how that's handled in just a minute, but $426 goes in there as a negative number. So we have two negative numbers, the cash plus the payroll taxes. Then if we go down a little bit further, we have this account number 6050, <clears throat> which is our payroll expense, and we get a chance to expense all of that. So we get a chance to expense... Um, two thousand dollars of that so we have one of the transactions taken care of now we have one more we need to finish up here though because we have four hundred and five dollars of payroll taxes or pay, payroll tax expenses we'll talk about what that is and then payroll taxes payable of 426 week cash of uh $831. We got to write checks to the federal and state government that total $831 to handle. First off, the uh, our payroll tax expenses, the business, which is the $405, and then to pay the federal government the $426, which is their uh, the amount that we've withheld from this employee that works for us. So we have $831 of liability. So we have quite, this is a pretty substantial amount of money we're going to have to pay out here all of a sudden. So what are these transactions going to look like? Well, let's go back here just a second. If we take a look at these transactions, we're going to end up with, on the, uh, we have a check for $831. Now we're on the lower part of this. $831 we're going to write. We have that payroll taxes payable. We have to pay that $426. You notice the entry right next door to that's the negative 426. This is now a positive 426. And then we have $405 more of uh, payroll taxes that we're accruing. That's just an expense to us as the business. So we end up with these two charges here, and we should end up at the end of the day with uh, somewhere around $8,095 left in our checking account. So you might check that out, see if you can come up with a number that looks about like that. But again, it's really important to, th to think about whether you want to hire people and payroll. You notice there's a fair bit of trouble in going through and handling payroll. It's one of the things that makes business complex sometimes, is things around payroll. 
but you know, be cautious. Independent contractors can be really very challenging if, if things don't go the way you would hope they were going. Okay, well, we'll summarize just a little bit of you know, this kind of financial accounts. Uh, once we summarize all of this, and we've just gone through a whole set of transactions here, we may want to go through and compile them. And in fact, we will go through and compile them in a balancing income statement. We're not attempting to do that here, but just to show you some what a balance sheet might look like. First off, in our balance sheet, we have these assets that we've talked about before, cash that we have and any equipment we might own in terms of intermediate assets, any land we might own probably as longer term assets. On the liability side, we have the debts of the business that come in things that we owe right now versus things we might want to pay later on, maybe you know, a year or two down the road, and then some that go way out there. Maybe Excuse me, might not be re retired till you know 30 years from now. And uh, the most important number that we get out of this is how valuable our business is. We're going to take those things that we, these assets, we're going to subtract from those our liabilities, and then that will tell us how much our business is worth. And that's one of the most important reasons to keep a bookkeeping system is to see whether that number is getting bigger or smaller as you move from one year to the next. Cash flow statements play a little bit different role in this because we want to know how much money is coming into the business. You know, in this case, we don't care how it comes in the business. It could come into the income we've earned. It could be money we're borrowing from the bank. Maybe we decided to, you know, sell some old pickups we have or whatever. But all the money that flows into the business is treated as cash inflow. All the money that flows out, again, we don't care where it comes, where the outflow is from, but a lot of it's expenses. It could be loan payments we've made. It could be that we bought a new tractor, whatever. We have all this money that's flowing out. And the money that's left over is the net cash flow. What do we care about cash flow? Well, we kind of like to look at cash flow on a month-to-month -month sort of basis, and you want to make sure when you have a cash flow statement that you produce for yourself that your cash is always positive. If it ever goes below negative, all of a sudden you're getting yourselves in a really in a deep, dark hole because you may not have enough money to keep the business going. Cash flow problems are one of the major reasons that businesses have financial problems. And there are ways to solve that. Just make sure you have a friendly banker and somebody you can talk to about when those cash demands maybe exceed the money that you have coming in or that you have available to you. And lastly, you want to be concerned about what your income statement happens to say about the business in the past year. You're going to sell some crops and livestock, and again, say you're going to have some expenses, in this case, a little over 127000 You might have some other things that are involved in this, some depreciation that you've taken on some equipment or some interest you've had to pay to the bank. And uh, after you subtract those things out, you should have some operating income. We typically call this thing profit. And remember, as I told you at the outset, $31,000 in this particular case is not something you take to Walmart to spend because you still have the principal part of your loan that we talked about earlier, plus you have income taxes to pay on this. All of those are things that occur after we've computed profit. Those things are after profit sort of, of deductions or you know, reductions is probably the better word to your profits. So you know, be cognizant of that. I mean, more than one person has made what they think is profits and thought they could go out and spend that. And really, that is not the way the world works. So we've gone through a bunch of transactions. And hopefully, all of you have been able to follow this. Um, the end game here is to generate an income statement, a cash flow statement, and a balance sheet. So you can tell whether you made money, if you had enough Resources set aside so that you didn't run out of money, you didn't run out of cash, and then thirdly, that this business is getting more valuable. That's what all of you want when you're in business, is to see that equity in the business get larger as you move through time. The most important reasons for running a business. So with that, that's the end of our uh, bookkeeping segment for today. and. We will uh, talk about these other financial statements at another point in time. So uh, with that, everyone have a good day.